The Housing Assistance Council is pleased to host today's webinar sponsored by Terrellville Soul Housing Corporation and Community Resources and Housing Development Corporation through a grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Rural Housing Services. The Section 514-516 Farm Labor Housing Program provides loans and grants for development of on-farm and off-farm housing. The program is operated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Development, Housing, and Community Facilities Program Office. Section 514 loans and Section 516 grants are provided to buy, build, improve, or repair housing for farm laborers. Funds can be used to purchase a site or leasehold interest in a site, to construct or repair housing, daycare facilities, or community rooms, to pay fees to purchase durable housing furnishes, furnishings, and to pay for construction loan interest. Today's webinar, Financing Farm Labor Housing with USDA Section 514-516, Part 1, Preparing the application is the first in a three-part series, which will provide information to potential project sponsors on how to effectively utilize USDA Section 514-516 loan and grant funds to finance farm labor housing. The webinar will further present information on eligible project sponsors, eligible costs, and requirements of the application. Additional information will be provided on on-site control, SHPO clearance, preliminary plans and specifications for the project, preparing development and operating bu budgets, sources and uses statements, market study requirements, supportive service plans, required federal forms, affirm affirmatively fair, affirmative fair, action, fair housing market plan, and other elements of the pre-application. Scoring criteria will be reviewed, particularly relating to energy efficiency and other preferences. The use of other financial resources to support the development of the project will also be examined. We have uh, a few additional upcoming events coming to announce. Um, part two of this webinar series, final application closing, will be held on February 7th. And the third uh, part of the series, um, construction and lease, lease up, will be held on February 28th. And HACC also has a, a training coming up in March in New Orleans on the Section 502 packaging um, program. I'm pleased to announce today's two, introduce today's two speakers. Jeannie Shaw is a nonprofit manage, uh, organization management profes, professional whose expertise has helped produce housing, community, and economic development projects throughout the United States. With over 30 years of experience, she uses a repertoire of skills to assist nonprofit organizations to build capacity, secure funding, and implement a variety of programs that include home ownership, self-help housing, farm labor housing, single family and multifamily housing development, home mortgage and small business lending, loan portfolio and asset management, job creation strategies, job training and employment programs, renewable energy and community facilities, housing assistance programs and social services. Joe Unteed has worked with, worked with Community Resource and Housing Development Corporation for the past 25 years providing technical assistance to nonprofit developers under the 514-516 program. To date, Joe has assisted one project in Kansas and 11 projects in Colorado, two of which coupled with the low-income housing tax credit with the 514-516 program. In 2018, there are three projects expected to close Kansas, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. CRHDC was responsible for starting with USDA Farm Labor Roundtable discussions in the 1990s in Colorado, which continue today and are now led by USDA staff. These trainings are, are a time of information sharing and project management training specific to farm labor projects. Joe and Jeannie, I hand it off to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, this is Jeannie Shaw, and thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day to attend this. Uh, we are trying to use this tool as a means for not just conducting this webinar today, but having something available for folks who may uh, determine they have a need for understanding the 514-516 program better in the future, and they will be able to access uh, the webinars on HACS website as well as on uh, Community Resources and Housing Development's website and Tara Del Sol's website. So we plan to use these as tools. Uh, for those folks who are interested in the project, but as well as those folks who are receiving technical assistance from us. 
So to begin, um, first of all, I wanted to give just a short background on 514 and 516 technical assistance. Our services are intended to encourage the development of domestic and migrant farm labor housing. And this webinar series is designed to provide an overview of the requirements and processes for securing that funding to successfully develop the project and then ultimately to successfully own and manage the project. And uh, there we are. So Stephanie talked a little bit about uh, CRHDC. Uh, CRHDC was established in 1971 to address intolerable living conditions and lack of adequate housing for migrant farm workers in rural areas of Colorado. And they have gone on to uh, develop more than 900 units of migrant and seasonal farm worker housing. They manage over 800 units in rural communities, rental housing in rural communities as well. Uh, the organization moved on to research and develop housing opportunities for low-income and rural families through the construction of safe, sanitary, and affordable housing. And that mission expanded over the years to address community needs, both urban and rural, on a statewide and regional scale. This includes activities geared toward increasing the financial viability and sustainability of families and the communities in which they live. Uh, seem to be stuck on that slide. Perhaps. Here we are. Okay. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to take this opportunity to share some, some examples of projects that they have been involved with uh, in the development, uh, either through management, ownership, or through technical assistance. And several of CRHDC's projects have received na national recognition for their design and quality. Shared All Soul Housing was formed in 1973, so you can see that both of these organizations have been around for a long time. And they, their goal was to provide decent home and suitable living environments for rural New Mexicans. Today, Shared All Soul has also expanded its mission uh, and is advancing the needs of farm workers and rural families by sharing its technical expertise to help other organizations address their community housing needs through the Farm Labor TA program, self-help home ownership opportunity prog programs, workforce investment opportunity opp programs and services. Terry Del Sol also owns and manages more than 1,000 rental units serving low-income families and special populations, and this includes 300 units for farm workers. Uh, Tierra del Sol is recognized as a leading producer of affordable housing in the Southwest, and that can only be achieved through the partnerships and collaborations that it has with communities, housing advocates, and stakeholders. And as anyone who's delved in these, this type of uh, projects before, you know that those projects absolutely have to involve that type of relationships. Both organizations have significant experience in developing new construction projects and rehab projects and in leveraging funding needed to complete those projects. And here are some um, examples of farm worker housing projects that Terra del Sol has developed. So what is 514-516? Um, our, our technical assistance services um, are dedicated to developing off-farm housing. This funding can be used for on-farm housing, but our technical assistance is specifically to develop off-farm housing, which means that um, we're working with project sponsors 
uh, nonprofit organizations, farm worker organizations, that those sort of folks to develop uh, projects that are not not located on a farm but nearby for the access to the work. 514 is a loan that RD offers with terms of 1% interest amortized over 33 years. The 516 portion of this funding is a grant. Only nonprofit organizations and government entities are eligible to receive a grant. Rural development will allow up to $3 million per project. And they also provide uh, Section 521 rental assistance or operating assistance for the project. Most projects have a mix of loan funds first as the majority of the funding and some grant funds. With rental assistance, there's a sufficient cash flow to cover debt service. And these funds can be leveraged with several other federal programs and private sources. Eligible uses of uh, 514, 516 funds, and I know Stephanie covered a bit of this, uh, can be used to buy, build, improve, or repair farm labor housing, purchase land and install site improvements that's on and off site improvements such as water and sewer systems, roads, lighting, and other off site facilities. You can use the funding to furnish refrigerators, stoves, dishwashers, window coverings, and in the case of migrant uh, farm workers, you can include furniture, beds, and dressers, and things like that. The funding can also be used to provide community facilities that include community meeting rooms, cafeterias, child care facilities, recreational facilities for children, maintenance and storage facilities that the project may need. Funding can be used to pay legal, architectural, and engineering fees, construction loan interest, and provide temporary relocation if you're if you are developing a project where there's existing tenants that are, need to be temporarily relocated while the project is renovated. This map shows uh, this, the areas of the country that both CRHDC and Tierra del Sol are responsible for providing their services. CRHDC oversees the western region and Tierra del Sol oversees the central and eastern region. However, I just wanted to tell you that despite their assignments, one call to either one will put you in touch with the TA provider for the region where you plan to develop housing. So what kind of technical assistance services are provided? Uh, these our technical assistance services are provided at no charge to the recipients because USDA is funding the technical assistance services. So to begin with, our technical assistance services, um, we like to start off with assessing the capacity and readiness of the organization to own, develop, manage a farm labor housing. So we provide orientation on the program. We review the organizational capacity of of each project sponsor, which includes the skills and abilities of board and staff. We also take a look at the articles, bylaws, and nonprofit status, board membership, and any previous development experience that helps us determine the extent of technical assistance needs. We review uh, the organization's financial statements to make sure that there's adequate financial capacity to take on a project like this. And uh, we provided technical assistance on, on how to prepare financial statements all the way to reviewing um, the, the organization's audits. The next um, step is, is to take a look at whether there is a need for the farm worker housing in the area where you would like to develop the project. So we provide technical assistance on the preparation of the market analysis using the guidance provided in, in the funding announcements and handbooks. And then we also take a look at the site, the proposed site. If, there, if a site hasn't been selected, we can help conduct uh, feasibility reviews to determine what is the best site. And 
Any site selection analysis includes an environmental review, State Historic Preservation Office um, clearances to ensure that, that uh, there's no historic considerations that need to be addressed at the project. We provide guidance on, on land development and interest infrastructure needs, assembling the development team, construction design requirements, and developing preliminary plans. And one of the more important things is, is incorporating energy efficiency features in the project. This is an, a scoring criteria that if your project doesn't include this, it probably won't compete well. This is nat nationally competitive funding. And so it's important not only to be able to compete well, but also for the long-term cost efficiency of the, in operating the project. The other aspect is um, we help organizations uh, review affirmative fair housing m marketing plans that help to guide outreach activities to maintain a healthy waiting list. And the supportive services plan is designed to bring in partners that can provide other needed services uh, or ensure that farm workers have access to those services such as health care, child care, counseling, and access to other programs. The other aspects of technical assistance, of course, are analyzing the financial feasibility of the project. So we provide technical assistance to help guide estimating the project and operating costs, preparation of the development budget and operating budget. And Joe is going to go over those in more detail. And then also, those, those costs are going to drive the need for Section 521 rental assistance. The, the rental assistance that's offered on 514, 516 projects, they're one of the few programs that still offer project-based rental assistance. You know how rare those are to be able to secure these days. So. Who is eligible to apply? They need to be a broad-based nonprofit organization uh, that has nonprofit status, and its membership board otherwise um, reflects a variety of interests in of the area where the housing will be located. So, if it's in an agricultural community, we do like to see that there's representation of growers uh, and agricultural. Um, workers in, involved in the organization. It can be a limited partnership with a nonprofit general partner. Typically, we see that kind of uh, entity structured for low-income housing tax credits. It could be a nonprofit organization of farm workers <clears throat> that, that doesn't necessarily have experience in owning and managing the farm worker housing. We will provide technical assistance to help them build capacity. It can be a federally recognized Indian tribe or an agency or political subdivision of a state. So who is eligible to apply? Oh, we just did that. Hang on a second. I didn't got to get the slide to move. So who is eligible to live in the property? Farm workers, of course, uh, and the type of farm work, it's any person or family member who receives a substantial portion of their income from primary production of agriculture or agriculture commodities, handling of those commodities in their unprocessed stage, or the processing of these commodities. And so that includes cultivating the soil, raising or harvesting agriculture or aquaculture, Catching, netting, handling, planting, drying, packing, grading, storing, or preserving in its unmanufactured state any agriculture or aquaculture commodity. Eligible farm workers include those involved in delivering to storage or to market or to a carrier that is going to take the product to market. It includes processing workers. They're taking unprocessed uh, agricultural 
or agricultural commodities and processing it for the market. And the farm worker household, the farm worker in the household must earn a minimum of $5,753 a year from agriculture or farm employment. One of the requirements of these projects is that the person, the farm worker, must be a citizen of the United States or have legally admitted for permanent residence. Farm workers can include any person or family member who is retired or disabled but was employed in farm work at the time of their retirement or when they became disabled. So the first step in order to determine whether uh, you are uh, have a, a feasible project is to take a look at what is the need for farm labor housing in the community. And it's important to have an understanding of this because it will drive the feasibility of the project. In other words, what kind of housing is available to serve the farm workers currently? Is there enough of it? What's the condition? Is it in poor shape, good shape? Uh, what's the vacancy rate and cost of other housing that they have access to? And uh, if there's on-farm housing provided, is there a need for off-farm rental housing? One of the most important things is to clearly identify the area where eligible farm workers will be recruited to reside in the proposed project. Uh, the farm workers can be employed year-round, seasonally, or those that migrate into the area. And that includes processing workers. So it's important to understand where farm workers are coming from or finding employment and what type of employment they have. And then also when you're considering the, the scope of the project, you want to take a look at how far do they have to travel to work and how do they get there? And how much income do they earn? Is that seasonal income? Is your project going to serve migrant workers where it will be open just uh, seasonally? In that case, you can use the operating assistance rather than rental assistance to help uh, pay for the cost of operating the project. And after you've decided that there's a need for farm labor housing, the next step is to evaluate the sites that are available where the project can be built. And keep in mind, vacant buildings are an option for um, uh, potentially being renovated to provide housing. And I'm, with that, I am going to turn it over to Joe Unteed, who is going to talk about site assessment. OK, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of the meat of the application here and what you have to in, do to get prepared to submit the initial submittal. So after you've decided you've got your market study, it shows that there is, in fact, a need. Hopefully, you've got your eyes on a site, because in your market study, you have to identify the site. But um, we want to find a site that will meet the federal requirements for clearance. And if anybody's done a federal project, you know these uh, there are several things that they check, uh, proximity to wetlands, the floodplain, are you within 1,000 feet of a highway or 3,000 feet of a railroad? Um, are there any potential undesirables around airport runways, brownfields, uh, above ground storage tanks? And um, there are some links here that you can use. Also, I would encourage you to use your TA providers because we're very familiar with these and can help you do your site assessment. And then also USDA doesn't want projects that's like plopped out in the middle of um, a field or something with no support services around. So we want to make sure that there are services in the area, schools, shopping, churches, um, recreational facilities, 
And you will actually put a map in your application that shows the proximity to those items. Obviously, we always want local community support um, and evidence that zoning is available or annexing is possible and that you're working towards that. Step three, so we've got our marketing study, we've got our um, We've assessed the site to see if it's likely possible a good site. The next thing we want to do is take a, an idea of what our operating costs will be. So there is a multifamily asset management handbook, 3560-7, uh, and that is the um, handbook that will answer all your questions of what operating costs are included and how USDA evaluates those. But the operating uh, cost format is, sorry, I'm trying to get down a little bit. This is, the slide that's coming up is the actual form that's the 3560, that is the operating budget for USDA. And what I like to do is start with the operating <laughs> management and maintenance schedules, the, the actual costs here, the actual costs, and um, figure out what your total O&M expenses are for the project. Let's take a look for one second at the property management fees. USDA has a per door per occupied unit management fee. And these that were just, this is for the year 2018. So for instance, if I'm in Colorado, the $59 per door per occupied unit is my allowable management fee for my operating budget. So those would go in right here. Then also I can, I can include my site management payroll, um, the, the, the maintenance and repairs payroll, and itemize out all of my costs. So I get bottom line here, my total O&M expenses. This is the second page, second part of the budget that number then goes forward to the, oh, somebody's moving my slides here. <laughs> Hold on. Somebody's moving slides, guys. Okay. Just a sec. Sorry. That number goes forward to right here. So we've got our total rental income, less any kind of uh, our vacancies, and we've got our total, uh, we subtract out our total operating maintenance, uh, operating and management expenses here, our debt payments to USDA based on our loan amount at 1% for 33 years, our transfer to the reserves, which this is ultimately based on something called the Comprehensive Needs Assessment, which does not really come until your project is accepted for further fund, for further evaluation. So I'm not sure, USDA might be able to give us a little more guidance on this, but what we typically do is put 1% um, of the USDA loan grant amount um, or if you've got a much larger project with tax credits, bumping that up to what your other funders will need for operating and maintenance for your initial um, replacement reserve. And then we get down to the bottom line, subtracting everything out, and we get our ending cash balance. I just want to say to folks that this is different than a lot of funding sources that are looking for a certain debt service coverage. 
this translates the same way, but this operating budget, you do not want an excessive amount of cash. Here is your ending cash balance for these projects, or your budget will be rejected. The last page of the budget has your rent amounts, which comes up with your um, annual income, which was over on that first page, that $180,000. Step forward, estimating the development costs. Um, First of all, assembling your development team, architects, project manager, energy consultants, anybody on the city, um, engineers, all of those uh, are allowable costs. And I would encourage everybody to, just as you're developing any kind of housing project, get those that development team assembled. And you can begin to come up with your development budget. Now, un what I like to do, and we share this with nonprofits that the TA team is working with, is just use a standard Excel budget because you can get much more detailed as to what you need for your construction costs. You're able to revise it, look back what you had originally and how you've revised the budget. And then when you're ready to submit your application, you can transfer it on to something called a 1924-13. This is actually initially an estimate done by um, most likely your architect. And the construction costs are very detailed according to the standard construction line items. So the construction costs are very detailed, but then our soft costs on the last page of the 1924-13 are, um, you can see there's just a few few spaces here. So if you will, over here, I ha we have uh, kind of made this work. But this is why I like to start with an Excel spreadsheet and then transfer it over to here when we're ready to submit the application. This 1924-13 and the operating budget that we went over are both mandatory forms that are required in the initial application. And, um, and then it's signed. Typically, at this point, it's an initial estimate, and it's signed by the architect and the owner of the project. This will be revised several times when you submit your second round for further processing, and then probably right prior to closing, you'll have yet another updated 1924-13 uh, as your costs get more firmed up. And most likely, there is going to be some kind of funding gap. The $3 million is most likely not going to fund the whole project. So you're going to have to identify in the application how your funding gap is going to be filled. And if you've got commitments for those funds, that's very good. Typically, the notice of funding availability says that you will apply for funds within 12 months of receiving the USDA application. But I always tell people, the more of these that you have firmed up over here, the better um, you're for your application to receive uh, a commitment. The tough one here is the low-income housing tax credits. Most of them are very competitive, and you're not going to get tax credits first out of the chute. But you have 12 months from the date of the initial um, announcement that you were selected for further funding to apply for low-income housing tax credits. Um, I also want to say something about the funding gap. The, the sponsor is required to put in at least 10% of their own funds. 
well, uh, they're supposed ten percent into the project. So that can come in the form of donated land, um, market study, um, update upfront development costs, other sources that you have identified. So in the packet, you guys will have a um, we will give you a checklist, and we will also give you tabs so you can sub you can prepare your own application. And in there, it will give you guidance of how to address this funding g gap and your contribution, and so it's clearly communicated to USDA. Okay. And then there's a whole bunch of other things things that have to get done to get your application ready to submit. So obviously you're going to have to illustrate site control, either an option on the land or a warranty deed or something that shows you own the land. If you have an option on the land, just a word to the wise here, this is not something that's going to get funded next month and close the following. So I tell people at least uh, at least a six-month renewal um, on your options. So let's say maybe they're going to announce the applications in September. I'm going to make it through September with a six-month renewal. And, um, and make your seller of the property aware of the realistic timing of this funding, because what we hate is to have a site can under control and then the seller gets nervous or it gets too drawn out and we lose the site late down the road. Okay, Your market study just demonstrating the need and demand for farm labor housing, what Jeannie had gone over, and we want to make sure that that corresponds with your rents, that corresponds with your vacancy rate you're using, that corresponds with the site you're using, so everything is uh, correct information in the application. State Historic Preservation Office is part of the environmental review process, but I want to forewarn people, if you've got a site in mind, get in contact with your State Historic Preservation Office. Usually there's an application online or a way to apply to see if a, you can get a, the site cleared through them. It's called a 106 review. and. Um, we are finding in several states that uh, they are saying, oh, this site has never had a review, so now it needs something called a cultural review. And that's where someone is hired by you that's approved by the State Historic Preservation Office, and they go out and they review the site, they provide a write-up, and they give guidance to the SHPO office if it is okay for clearance. It's going to cost you several thousand dollars, and it's going to take about 60, 90 days. So I would say to everybody, if you've got a site in mind and you're thinking of applying this next round of USDA, get the SHPO request in now. If you happen to be a state that is involved in a state clearinghouse process, which means you have to go through a state notification process if you're applying for federal funds, you need to do that ahead of time, and there will need to be documentation of that in your application in the form of an SF-424, I think it's 924, 424, sorry. <laughs> but that clearinghouse, uh, some of the rules around that or the states that are participating have changed, so I would urge everybody just to double check if your state has a state clearinghouse regulation. Evidence of other committed funds, or at least letters of interest. So let's say your home application is not until uh, the fall and you're applying. It's always good to get a letter from the home agency that says these this agency is able to apply. We encourage them, and these are the type of projects that we like to fund. Okay. You will get two points, typically for each supportive service that you have at your property. And these do not necessarily have to be at your property. They can be community-based services that you will link your tenants up with. 
for instance, maybe there's a um, home buyer education class that's free, that's at the community center, um, and you're going to refer people there. You can get a letter that states that those, those services will be provided to anyone that is referred there, and the letter must be in the application, and then the actual service must be outlined in your supportive service plan. So again, these can be on-site services and services that are available in the community. Um, other examples of services might be English as a second language. Um, sometimes there's pesticide training that come on site. Sometimes there's mobile um, medical vans. All of those are examples of supportive service plans. This next one is a biggie, energy conservation plan. You are likely not going to receive enough fund, enough points to be funded if you do not have an, um, participate in LEED or um, one of the energy plans. You will need to involve an energy consultant early on to make sure that your plans are, in fact, will be acceptable to whatever program you're participating in. You will have to have testing at the end to make sure that you have passed the tests for that particular energy conservation plan. And um, you will need to include the cost of that energy consultant in your development costs. This is 50 to 70 points. Uh, it's a huge portion of the actual application. So again, if you don't have this piece, you're likely not going to be funded. And I would encourage everyone to look at the last year's NOSA and just see how the points are awarded and uh, start those conversations early with your development team of how you can maximize um, the energy points. And other development, oh, whoops. OK, and when you go to assemble the application, there is a checklist, and there are standardized tabs that are created by the technical assistance team. And we recommend, really recommend that you use these. First of all, it provides some uniformity to the application and helps USDA in their review of it. It also helps assure that you're not missing something. And um, I'll show you a checklist here. So I'm not going to read this to you, but you can see the checklist and then here, and it will have corresponding tabs, the tab cover pages that will go with this checklist so that you can assemble your application and make sure that you don't forget anything. I want to encourage everybody to pay attention to the deadline for the application. It will say an Eastern Standard Time for the electronic submittal. And then if you're submitting a hard copy, it's according to the locality's timing. I don't like to wait till the last minute because I've had stuff get hung up on email. I would encourage everybody to submit these a day or, or two days ahead of time to make sure if you're electronically submitting it that you get it in on time. If you're hand delivering the package, make sure you allow for weather, make sure you allow for drive time. Make, I had one time we delivered one and we had a flat tire. So luckily we had enough time that we it didn't run us down to the deadline. So make sure that you've get allowing yourself plenty of time to do that. This is the second page of the checklist. 
And um, right here on number 19, application scoring criteria, there is actually a, an electronic form, if you will, that you fill out for USDA, and it and you will, it will ask you questions, did you include this, did you include this, did you include this, and it will tell you what your application score is for the purpose of submitting it. Okay. So just in summary, I want to tell everybody, we, you've got your TA providers here, and as Jeannie said, the service is free to you guys to help in whatever way we possibly can to help you get an application submitted and have it be uh, correct and accurate and good. Um, right now is the time to prepare for the applications. I see lots of California people on there. I don't know. If, but um, I know there's a couple of groups in California that are working right now on their application for this next round which unfortunately we never quite know when the next round is going to come. They typically give us uh, 60, 90 days completion. But if you have your market study done, your SHPO letter, um, you've looked at your development costs, your operating costs, you're getting your um, funding commitment letters together, you're going to be very prepared for that uh, when that NOSA comes out. Here is a list of contacts, and as Jeannie said, if you contact any of us, it will get you in the door to get technical assistance. So this uh, webinar will be on the, RCA, on the um, HAC website so that you can pull this up, and I'm guessing you can get copies of the slides. They, too. Hey, Joe. Yes. Uh, this is Jeannie. I just wanted to add a little bit of information about some of the past items that we've seen as far as scoring criteria. If your application is going to be showing construction cost savings, uh, that can secure additional points. That includes the use of leveraged funds, donated land waive permit fees or equity position in the project. Uh, operational cost savings are another scoring criteria, so if there's real estate tax abatements, or if uh, not a source uh, other than rural development is providing tenant subsidies, or if there's donated services, those are other ways that you can score well. If the project is located in a county that has a record of persistent poverty, those are also scored highly. Uh, the tenant services, as Joe mentioned, uh, the, for every committed tenant service you can provide, you can get two points. And then also the energy initiatives um, are other areas where you can increase your, your competitiveness of your application. Yeah, and I think that's partly work, working with the TA team. We can help you maximize those points. So I know we've only got about 10 minutes left, and they wanted us to save time for question and answers. So Yeah. Yeah, and just one other thing. If uh, your project encounters any NIMBY in issues, uh, we have experience in helping you address them, uh, so please, uh, you know, feel free to call on us to help help you um, develop a plan for for making sure that the community supports the project. We do not have any written questions in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, please, you know, start typing so we can see it. Um, See, there, there's some questions coming in. I'm also going to unmute all of your uh, all of the lines. So if you have background music or any noise, please um, individually mute your line. Um, but I want to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. In the meantime, I thought I would point out a couple of items on the checklist. Uh, item six refers to a check for $24. That's a check that's required to accompany your application when it's submitted, and that check should be received by USDA before the deadline. So make sure that if you're submitting electronically, you still have to submit the check to USDA. 
The other uh, item I wanted to point out is number seven, evidence the application, applicant is unable to obtain credit from other sources. This is what we fondly refer to as a decline letter. It could be a letter from a bank saying we don't fund farm labor housing projects or our interest rates are, are uh, X percent, which would um, mean that the project was not financially feasible uh, to provide a low rent for farm workers. So we can help guide you on, on how to satisfy that requirement. Are there any questions? Going once, going twice, even a four to the end of the slide. Um, clearly, you ladies did an excellent job. Since there's no questions, everyone understood everything perfectly. Um, we do look forward to seeing everyone in part two of the webinar series uh, and part three. So please don't forget to register for those events. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank our speakers, Joe and Jeannie, and our sponsors, Tia Del Sol and Community Housing Resources and Housing Development Corporation. And, and I don't want to thank everyone who attended today's event. Um, like we said, we'll have a recording of the session and the materials posted later this, day, later this week. Um, but thank you so much for your attendance and have a wonderful day. <laughs>